Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is a British Asian Muslim woman who loves having sex and isn't afraid to talk about it. Welcome stand-up comedian and writer Sadia Azmat. Hi, Sadia. How are you? Hi, I'm really good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for asking. (laughs) Thank you for joining us from... Are you in London right now? I am. I'm in the UK. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I just love the intro. It was really funny. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, there seems to be some conflict in your persona, uh, your upbringing, who you are today, what you do. So I guess um, let's start from the beginning, right? Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So I'm... I guess you could say in American speak that I was like the class clown. I really like goofing around. I like making people laugh. And um, I really enjoyed writing as well. And so I went through doing a few kind of straight jobs, conventional jobs, you could say, and then fortunately just fell into stand-up comedy. I didn't really understand it as a thing. It's not something we get taught at school. And then um, kind of did a few sets and figured it out. and honestly, as a Muslim, I find so much relief in in kind of having it as a as a platform to kind of say the things that I guess in day to day life the way that I'm treated is is kind of like unheard of or or not kind of what people would associate with someone like me, which is just being like anybody else, you know, being funny, being quirky, being horny, being all of these things. Um, so kept kept writing and you know how comedy is like you know other doors open did a podcast managed to get a book deal um so yeah I think it's just a bit of a hustling type of thing but I'm from like you know I'm from you guys call it the hood I'm from like our hood the ghetto type of thing and so you kind of the hustler is like you know you're kind of like born with that kind of spirit I guess you could say um I think the disconnect between like Muslim, being a Muslim woman who enjoys sex is great for comedy because um, it's a surprise, you know, best, the best comedy is a shock. So that's great for comedy, but in real life, <laughs> I'm not lying, Holly, it's hard to catch a dick, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like, because when you wear like a headscarf, people were thinking that, you know, wait a minute, like maybe she's looking for a jihadi, like a terrorist. I'm not, by the way, just in case your listeners think I am. Or they think that, you know, um, I'm already married, which I'm not, or all sorts of things. So I think, um, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know. You probably get, you're, you're stunning. You probably get a lot of male attention. And, um, you know, I, I can't speak for almost the women, but I certainly don't. Or you either don't get any or you get some very strange kind of um, specific fetishization, which really doesn't apply either. But at this point, I'll take anything. Um, so <laughs> I'm just messing. But yeah, so that's how I came to be. I, I feel like where I wasn't very successful on the dating scene, um, all of those kind of stories ended up being great material for comedy and like people loved it. So it was funny how, although that was kind of like, you know, not what I was looking for in reality, in comedy, it really helped because people just loved it and people could relate because, um, you know, it's hard, I guess, for everyone these days to date and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, comedy, I think is the the best comedy, like you said, is kind of like taking pain and struggle and, and turning it around into something else, right? And turning it into something relatable because there's always a piece of somebody else's pain that I think all of us can relate to. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about your upbringing. Um, what was, you know, your childhood like? Yeah, so, I mean, to be fair, like... I grew up in Leighton, which is East London, and there was like so much diversity there to the point where diversity wasn't invented at at that point in time. Because, you know, when you're kids, you don't really see all of these labels. You just live life as it is. You're not counting how many, you know, people of race are certain in your classroom and stuff like that. So everybody just accepted everybody. Um, I think you guys call it Indian, um, where we call it Asian or South Asian in, in the UK. And I think people think that my upbringing was a lot stricter than it actually was. So like people associate Muslim people with like curfews and all these types of stuff. But actually my parents was quite laid back. Um, I was allowed to say and do really mostly what I wanted to do. Although I think where certain rules came in, it was to protect me. So I certainly wasn't dating or anything like that. But it's not to say that I wouldn't, it's not to say that they're in 
impression of it kind of really put me off. I think what I was trying to do was just not get arranged marriage because what my mum would say when I was a kid is like, you know, if you if you be naughty, I'm going to send you back to India and get you married. And that was like when I was a kid, like four or five. So I was really scared of marriage. So although like people always think that I'm like ready for marriage and stuff, that was the thing that I was scared of the most for whatever reason, because I, I just didn't want to marry some villager like she was trying to hooked me up with some this is pre-tinder obviously and she was trying to hook me up with a stranger I was like no no no, that's not gonna happen so um but yeah for the most part it was pretty pretty uh kind of you know what you would expect like you know education was a big thing more because I was trying not to have an arranged marriage so I was like if I'm good at school then I'm gonna be okay so there was that um I was a bit chubby so, so yeah go on please sorry when your mom said that to you was like was it a joke or was she really using it as a threat? She was really using it as a threat. Yeah. I don't think that she meant it, but as a kid, I took it as, as a punishment to be like, they would just randomly take us on holiday to India. So I didn't have any reason to think that that wouldn't happen. Basically knowing how Mm -hmm. much they love me now, I I know that they, they probably didn't mean it, but at the time we were watching so much Bollywood movies in the background. So, you know, that kind of world still was part of our reality in a way. Um, and my mom had some he- mental health issues as well. Not that we really noticed it as a kid. Like she, she looked after us really, really well. But at the same time, yeah, I think I think it was just like, you know, they really loved us, but they just wanted the best for us. And that's how, <laughs> at that time, that's what they used to say. Um, so I was trying to avoid it. Um, and then I was too good at avoiding it basically Holly so like I was like so good at not not experiencing or not exploring that side of my my kind of world then it gets to a point you know where you're kind of like "Mm, I guess it's a bit of FOMO or you know you just grow you grow feelings you grow in in general you know your friends are dating and stuff and then you get ready and then it's like you you just don't know what to do because also as an Asian person, right? Nobody markets to us like this dating world. We're seen to be very, um, what do you call it? Mm, we seem to be very kind of, uh, I don't know, outside of it, like an outsider in it. And people just assume that we're just looking for marriage or that we're very submissive. There's all of these you know, um, kind of labels or stereotypes about us. So before we're even in the game, like people have already kind of sized us up. So it's like, we can't even figure out who we are for ourselves because we have to battle all of these perceptions before we can then even start on an even playing field, if you like. So it's challenging, especially like with people, I would say from like the guys from my own community, like Asian men, like, you know, they would just assume certain things about you. And, And it's strange because you'd expect more understanding from someone from your own community, but I wasn't there. Mm. Interesting. So in, so in terms of marriage, like was it expected that you would grow up eventually and have an arranged marriage or were your parents open to you making that choice yourself? My parents probably thought I was a lesbian, Holly, because I was avoiding, <laughs> they probably just thought, no, honestly, I was a bit of a, a of a clown or slash whatever you want to call it, loser, if you want to call me a loser. I, I just didn't, I was just, I was goofy, man. So I was like, guys would laugh at my jokes and I could be funny around them, but um, I just, I didn't, I was awkward. I was an awkward teen. And so they probably was like, she don't really want to go down that marriage route. So they didn't really push it for me. So that's what made me think that they're not that strict because I have so many girlfriends who are like, you know, my parents are on me. They're trying to find me a partner or, you know, they're always telling me, you know, you need to get kids, you need to have this. But my parents was very relaxed. So they must have thought, you know, maybe it's not going to work out for her, which is weird in itself as well because, um, you know, I guess you don't want it either way. You should just be able to kind of like figure it out on your own. But no, I really didn't think that at all. Um I think it gave me space to um, just want to have a conventional relationship, you know, which is meet, meet a guy and then like kind of have a relationship and then consider marriage. But I think I think what gave a lot of the Asian men the power was thinking that they that, that I shouldn't be dating. And so it kind of gave them a lot of the kind of power and the control over the situation. Mm-hmm. Were your pa- Did your parents, did their union come from an arranged marriage? The cool thing is that 
my mum, when she was 16, she proposed to my father. So it was kind of like real cool for me because it was not like any story I've heard. So it was sort of arranged in the fact that um, my, you know, their parents uh, approved of it, but also very much love marriage because she was the one, you know, making the making the re- request and the proposal. So in a very strange situation, it was a mixture of both. So do you think that maybe that's why your parents weren't so strict about you having an arranged marriage because they wanted you to experience like what they had? No, <laughs> I think what happened is I think they came to this country to give. So my mom was born in the UK, but then she went to India and then she married my father and then they both moved here. And I think I think it's interesting that I just don't know that they fully understood the change that that move had on their own identity. So I think that they mm. were they just thought I wasn't very traditional in the Asian sense or I wasn't, you know, I was clearly avoiding all of the kind of housework and the cleaning. And like I I heard Cinderella story. I was like, no, no, no. Maybe if I'm just not doing the housework, they're going to think, you know, she's, you know, not not, going to be a good wife. So I basically avoided all of those kind of things. So I just don't think, I think they just thought, you know, maybe she just wants to keep her head in the book so I would just keep studying um, and they just didn't force the issue with me which is good because you know I didn't even want my parents picking my pair of shoes that I was going to buy let alone like my life partner like that would just be Mm. crazy so I I just couldn't see it Um, although in hindsight I ain't gonna lie that like you know I think I was too too vehemently against it and I think you know I definitely don't have anything against it if people you know want to choose that for themselves rather than being like you know feeling like that's for their family if people want to choose that for themselves I say you know please try anything because it's hard to find your life partner so you know you shouldn't really rule anything out too quickly but I was just trying to avoid deportation yeah and well I think we can all say too like you know sometimes we I mean I'm on my second marriage and I think I think I'm going to stick with this one this one, I think this this is this is the right one. But you know, I've made some I've made some poor choices in life partners before, and you know, there were times that maybe my my parents would have probably picked a better option for me. <laughs> I, I hear you. <laughs> but, I hear you know, you. wasn't gonna listen to them. Um, <laughs> so, what was your first expo- what was your first exposure to um, sex or pornography, and how did you feel about it at the time? So it was really weird because. Um, It was all like basically I was a real kid. I was a young kid. I was in a store and like I saw a porn magazine. Um, It was called Asian Babes in in the store. Um, It was like the highest grossing uh, erotica magazine or soft porn magazine in the 90s. It's been discontinued now. And I remember seeing this like Indian woman, scantily clad, you know, very nice shape, you know, very confident. And it was so different to any way that I'd ever seen like an Asian woman ever being portrayed. So that was definitely um, my first impression or my first kind of encounter with sex. Um, Also, I guess in the store, like men's reactions to the magazine also kind of like uh, had an impression on me in terms of it made them ve- very, it made them kind of very childlike, like they were very goofy or, or you could say even like just um, titillated around it. So it definitely as a, as a young person made me think that there was a lot going on about this kind of um, uh, nudity and, and sex. And I guess for me, because we didn't have conversations about that in the house um, for whatever reason or or even in school, I didn't really have those types of conversation with my friends because I guess around your friends, you want to seem like you know it all, you want to seem cool. So we didn't really bring it up because you acted like you knew it all. So it was really cool to think that as an Asian person, like, you know, I could I could have a sexual identity. So that's where I learned it. And then, um, yeah, I think it was just, again, it's something that it was quite aspirational. I didn't really know how to navigate my my place in it as a young person or as a young Muslim really because guys wasn't really checking for me like that and also I was trying to maintain my independence but I think I just went a little too far too far with it yeah well it's like the pendulum effect right you like usually it kind of yes. swings too far one way before it sort of <laughs> settles in the middle um so how old were you when you realized that sexuality was something that you wanted to embrace oh maybe very young maybe maybe around got to be I don't know approximately 14 15 16 that sounds very young but 
you know, you stumble across, you stumble across a bit of porn and you're like, oh, this looks pretty cool. <laughs> and the porn was very tame back then. Like it was, you know, you, especially as women, you don't see anything of the man, unfortunately. Um, and you, yeah, it was, I mean, very simple storylines, also very American, like, you know, photocopy machine, this, that and the other, <laughs> but it was quite entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes they went too far with a plot where they could have spent more time on the actual sex part. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely something that I wanted. I just, I think I struggled with, um, I guess, the semantics of what it meant in relation to love and the emotional side of it. And also we kind of, we always hear about sex from a very male perspective about their pleasure. Um, and they also have a lot more kind of freedom when it comes to sex. Whereas women, um, have so much judgment if we do, uh, choose to kind of, um, use our bodies, uh, or, you know, or kind of exercise our rights over our own sexuality. So it definitely felt complicated. Um, didn't have very good sex education at school. Uh, it was like a cartoon, which is very weird. Um, so definitely had our kind of intelligence insulted a little bit as a kid in school and stuff like that. Even every year they would try and bring it back, but we weren't learning much. So it was something that so I wanted. Say, I just yeah, sorry, I'm just a little bit. Cu- I'm a little bit curious about like what specifically the sex education was. Was it just like a man's penis enters a woman and then like a baby is born like how detailed were they because we didn't get any i don't recall ever getting sex education in school yeah sex education in the u.s is very bad yeah basically i remember one where we had a cartoon um and it looked like short circuit the robot and he went through people's windows and then people were just in bed but it was just weird because there was no explanation it was just showing you i guess like the anatomy of a female body and a male body but like not even the way we actually humans looks just like outlines um and maybe like the inner type of uh biology of it um yeah it was just a bit f- f- fancy like and then in science do you have like a bunsen burner so one time mm-hmm. we were able to put a condom on a bunsen burner um which was weird i don't remember <laughs> i don't know what that was all about that was How we was were just saying around <laughs> It was so weird. So, I mean, I think, and also you don't want to be that one person to ask the question that's too real because the whole, you know, how kids are, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. what do you know? Like, yeah. you know, I swear where yeah. I was in school, you would have got, you would have got taken, you know, people to laugh at you for, for weeks on end or that would have been your nickname for five years. So you had to be careful about, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, but the funny thing is, Holly, actually, you remind me, there was people having sex in the drama class. Like, literally, there was a girl sitting on top of a guy and, like, riding him. And this is probably when I was 15. So you could say that was, like, a an inappropriate type of sex education because, like, we have no sex education and then you're literally seeing this in a class. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, for real? <laughs> they were supposed to, in, in, they were, like, um acting it out well well um they were dressed but it didn't okay, look so they like were acting they were it acting. out so I, was this I like, like during was... a class and the teacher was like okay do your improv or was it like no but after class teacher, and kids were fucking around te- it was during the class but i don't think that the teacher was paying attention or she may have been uh-huh. otherwise um kind of like disposed is that the word otherwise yeah occupied she was out of the room Mm -hmm. or something and then like this girl I can't even say her name on here just because I don't want to get sued or anything like that her name was Crystal anyway she was wearing (laughs) I feel like they was doing it through their clothes basically I feel like because the noise she was making and stuff it wasn't it wasn't acting it wasn't but Mm -hmm. again it was just it was just weird also like again peer pressure you can't act uncool and also we're children like we how are we supposed to know what to how to respond or we can't break that mm. up but yeah it was um that's what would happen in you have the you'd have the few people that was very kind of already sexually mature you could say and then the rest of us just figuring out our own world in it i suppose yeah yeah absolutely okay guys we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we will come right back so we'll see you in just a few We all know Adam and Eve is the one-stop shop for everything sexy. 
And now, with my code HOLLY, you can get any one item for 50% off, plus 10 free gifts. And you'll even get free shipping. So spice up your sex life at adamandeve.com, but only if you use code HOLLY. Hey guys, we are back. Okay, so Sadia, um, you have dealt with a lot of backlash from the Muslim community online. Um, Has that ever discouraged you? Um, It hasn't. Um, I I feel like, first of all, like I have a rule with online, so I never try and get involved in the comment section. Um, Very wise. Yeah, I mean, it's (laughs) it's just, I don't know, I have so many things to do during the day. What what else would I get done? But... um, yeah, I mean, the, the reaction over the years to my comedy act, where I do talk about sex quite a lot as a Muslim person or hijabi, it has been mixed. I feel like we're getting to a place where it's definitely a lot more normal than it would have been when I started. But there still is a lot of um, pockets of my own community who I think don't get it or are quite sh- very, very quickly shocked by it and they don't choose to want to kind of understand more before they just like make a very quick judgment. Um, For instance, I had a book event. um, My book came out in June in the UK um, this year, 2023. And I had a bookshop event. And then the guy, he basically told me, Muslim women have complained, so we've cancelled your bookshop event. And I was like, what? And then he was like, well, you know, we don't want to... I'll need to read your book to make sure that it's not hateful. (laughs) And I was like, but it's a memoir. So it's my experience of my like, and I'm, there's a comedian, Frank Skinner, who's given it a quote. So I was like, I'm not a hate speech. And then they said that the Muslim women were fine with like a trans Muslim writer who wrote his book. They just don't like you. I was like, wow, like, what have I done? Like I literally, and for me, honestly, it's really important that, we don't shy away from topics like sex because I feel like at the end of the day, honestly, it's, it's disadvantageous to women because um, I don't want them to feel stigmatized. And if they're in a relationship, like I talk about in my book about my one, which gets to a point where it's not really good anymore, like they need to be able to kind of hear stories where they don't feel like they don't feel like that's it for them. They don't feel a pressure to stay in a relationship that's dysfunctional. Uh, they feel like they feel humanized. And so I'm just humanizing like experiences. And so, you know, certainly I, I like I would I wouldn't like to be completely negative. There definitely have been a few comments of support, but um I feel like it's just where there is a bit of resistance rather than just cancelling something. Maybe, you know, if if you can't, if people, if people talk to me, I definitely would like to reach a point of understanding. And look, I get it. There's a headscarf uh, on my cover of my book. There's a, a hijabi with, and the title is called Sex Bomb. But it's a bit of a joke because it's a nuanced title. Like, you know, for so long, Muslims have been associated with extremism or terrorism. And Sex Bomb can be a bit of a... Uh, sex can be a bit of a bomb in its own <laughs> in its own way, and I was kind of also uh, pondering, you know, could a Muslim woman be a sex bomb? Like, could could we be sexualized? Because for so long, mainstream media has has labelled or branded us as repressed, and and really um, kind of minimalised who we are. And so, I just wanted to be real uh, fi- fiery and like kind of authentic and kind of be you know honest about the fact that we have similar experiences to everybody else yeah yeah no absolutely how do you uh like take care of your mental health when you're facing this kind of backlash online do you just like really not read the comments or do are there ever times that you kind of feel like you've taken on too much oh no you know what as a comedian um I feel like comedy helps me a lot because it helps me put things in perspective. Comedy has forced me to grow um, a thicker skin and to have a kind of like a, a strong kind of uh, empathy towards different people. So, you know, I would find it worse if someone didn't laugh at my joke than if someone attacked me, to be honest with you, because my jokes mean so much to me. Um, and even if they don't agree with a point, I just want to make people laugh. So I, I, I understand, I respect, because I'm still, I'm, I'm a Muslim, I'm a person of faith. So I do respect the Muslims who made me not, you know, uh, maybe not like my work, but at the same time, um, I don't take it personally because I understand the reasons for why I'm doing what I'm doing. They just can't see them. And um, also I don't fully need to explain it to anybody, whether they are, you know, a fan or not a fan. Like, you know, we all have our um, 
kind of purpose and so I don't personally feel like I'm doing anything that I shouldn't be doing um I know why I'm doing it and you you can't please everybody so like if I was worried about pleasing people then you know I would <laughs> I would I would just give up now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah definitely um you decided to wear hijab one day when you were 19 yes. uh, what drew you to it then you know what? I had been going to a Saturday school, which was an Islamic Saturday school um, when I was like really young, like between 10 to 12. And um, it was girls only. And we would wear the scarf um, on Saturdays. And then after the school, we would take it off. So I think I was used to it at a young age. And then I always kind of didn't fully understand why I took it off. Um, and also, I lived in a very accepting area in London. So I put it on and like it didn't change anything like nobody even asked me the day I wore it for the first time like you know why are you doing that like you know it just felt like so much there was so much understanding what kind of made it complicated was then a few years later unfortunately when you know really terrible kind of attacks and terrorism was happening I think then Muslim women kind of became a bit more politicized um I think people who didn't understand the scarf felt a little bit um unsure about what the significance of it was but also didn't feel empowered to ask those questions or engage with it um it's very striking you know it's, it's very difficult to ignore and and it's normal to have questions so I don't really mind it like in the book I joke about it. I have sections where I kind of um riff on the questions I get asked so it's normal but at the same time you know I get it. I get that, you know, it's people's own choice at the end of the day. And I think where people might not know many Muslims, they may attach a meaning to it that doesn't even exist. So, yeah, I started wearing it because I kind of like really just like the way it looked. I feel like um, it was my thing. And um, obviously when that bad things like extremism started happening, I didn't want my thing to be now tainted with what was being happening sorry what was going on or I didn't want it to be taken away from me so that's why I kind of held on to it because otherwise it just felt like this special thing that I kind of chose to walk, chose to wear kind of like would be kind of completely um I don't know taken away the meaning uh it was really hard at sometimes for sure but it just felt silly because it's just a piece of cloth as well at the end of the day, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. You mentioned that, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand the significance of the headscarf. What yeah. What is the significance of the headscarf? There's a lot to it, really. I feel like it's a relationship that you have with it. You know, um, you, you kind of grow with it. So in Islam, it's about modesty. I guess it kind of reminds the person who's wearing it about modesty um, or whatever it means to them. Um I think that's what it is really and I think I think it's just also it could be a lot of things to different people it's just being pride having a bit of pride um in terms of you know your Muslim attire um and so almost kind of like like a Christian person wearing like a cross on their necklace yeah I think so you know what I mean just like identifying with their faith yeah I think and it's like a people don't commitment. necessarily yeah and people don't necessarily need to read like too much into that is what you're saying, at least no, for you. I, I wouldn't say so because I think, you know, people obviously where life is dynamic, you know, so on day one, you're not going to be the same person as you are on day 30, but you also can't tell what you're going to, what journey you're going to go through. So you might start, like, I'll tell you one thing, Holly, um, I was very spiritual before I wore it. Then when I wore it for a while, I was very lax in my faith because everyone was like, showering me with so much praise and they were like oh my god you're so like your faith is so good like you're so and so it felt like I could just take a seat back and I didn't feel that my faith or spirituality was as strong as it was before I wore it so people don't understand that you still need to work on your faith and I think it's an important thing for me but there are a lot of Muslims who maybe are better practicing Muslims and I and I acknowledge that so I don't think that it defines your faith entirely you know um we're all people like you said about your own uh you know decisions like we all can make mistakes sometimes or we could make better judgments and and so it's difficult because you will never see two hijabis the same 
they may look the same, they may be wearing the same color hijab, but the way they pray, the way where their faith is, you know, all of those things will be very different. Necess- you know, it wouldn't necessarily be the same. So I think it's just respecting that somebody's choice. Um, I think in the UK, for uh, you know, they kind of assume incorrectly that someone's forced us to wear it. And I think that's where the problems begin because a lot of people, they want to free women, free Muslim women from a plight that we have not had because nobody's forcing mm. us to wear it in the UK. This is a, a very, you know, advanced first world country. Um, in fact, people are like, don't wear it. <laughs> um, so people who are wearing it, it's really an active choice on their part. And I, I think that's what people um, either don't realize or just overlook. You know, it's so interesting because right there, what you instantly made me think of was drawing a parallel between, and this is probably going to sound weird to some people, but it's really (laughs) about autonomy and personal choice is like women deciding to be sex workers. Of course. Because most people, you know, believe that women are forced into that and that they couldn't have made their own choice on their own and they want to free them. Exactly like what you decided, right? Rescue them. And I know that like there's such drastic things, you know, like deciding to be a woman of faith and deciding to be a woman who has sex on camera are two different things. But but like on the surface, I'm just but then if you dig underneath it, it's all about personal choice. Right. Right. And so it's interesting how there is that that kind of connection. It's just like that suddenly occurred to me. It's so true. And I think that it comes down to the fact that as as a group, which is women, we're perceived to be, you know, I guess, objectified in many ways. And so whether you're a fully covered woman or whether you're doing sex work, um, people often take away our own, like you say, our own autonomy in the situation. They don't give us credit for making our own decision. Um, It's always coming from, like in the case of the sex worker, they must be from a bad background or must be having a troubled life to be able to do that it doesn't mean that you know but this is the connotation so it's a shame that especially in this modern world that we live in that people haven't changed the narrative or or even just look into it for themselves before that pre-judgment but I guess as human beings with all the information we're bombarded with people just you know try and connect the dots so quickly without looking at the the nuance behind it all Absolutely. I mean, stereotypes exist because like you, exactly what you just said, it's too much information for people to take. That's why people only read headlines and not the articles. It's like mm-hmm. there's too much going on in the world for everybody to think deeply and carefully about things. But this is why people like you exist. And, you know, also like the people who come on my podcast exist is to like talk about those nuances and and to open people's minds to other possibilities as well. Um, so I, I'm curious about because I actually, so just full disclosure, I was raised atheist. So I don't, okay. I don't come from a faith-based background at all. Um, but what is, what does your faith mean to you? My faith is really important um, to me. Um, I think what happens is where you're a visible person of faith, like when you wear kind of like, you know, the uniform, if you like, I think um, people maybe people attach certain meanings to it without kind of like, basically what I'm saying is, I guess it, for, for a lot of people's perceptions, they don't see you, the person, they just see the kind of you as the person of faith. So it means a lot to me, but I think it's a private thing, like your faith, because as I, as I said before, I think it's kind of like, depends on where you are, you know, sometimes you could work better at it. Sometimes, you know, um, your faith is on point and you look the same. So it's not something that people can really judge just by looking at you or your external kind of, um, yeah, the external look, I guess is what I'm saying. So it means a lot to me. Um, I think it's very grounding. Comedy is wild. (laughs) So I feel like I'm really grateful that I have, uh, this kind of foundation, uh, that kind of reminds me, um, and, and kind of like, yeah, it speaks well to me and kind of like reminds me of having a purpose, um, gives me humility, um, all of the things that people do find on their kind of journey in life anyway, or for, for instance, let's say mental health, where, you know, people constantly are talking about patience and gratitude um, and charity. My, my faith already gives me like all of those information. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be without it. I think it's um, 
like really, really helped me to stay centered and focused and try to kind of aspire to do a little bit better than I guess without it. I would have from for me personally, I don't know, you know, I would I would feel like, yeah, I would be lost without it. Mm hmm. So um, obviously, uh, as you've mentioned, you you wrote a book, a memoir last year called Sex Bomb. Tell us about what inspired you to write this in the first place. So I was doing jokes, um, you know, obviously in stand up for a while um, about relationships and sex and stuff like that. And then um, I wrote this article um, in the UK. They put it out at the beginning of um, Ramadan and they gave it this title. It was called Horny, Mun Horny Muslim Women Like Me Shouldn't Exist During Ramadan. <laughs> and it went viral. Like it really, really blew up, literally. Um I think it created a lot of conversation. But to me, like, I don't really feel like sex has ever been shameful or taboo. Um, and it just made me realize that even though it was 2020, no, 2019 at the time, that we really haven't even scratched the surface. And I was just thinking, this is crazy. Like, I, I love talking about sex. I don't want to do that forever. So I said, wait a minute, like, let me just put this book out and do it once and for all. And so fortunately, I bumped into my editor, Katie Packer, um, and then we got the book deal. Um, and I really wanted it to be an honest um, kind of, yeah, no holds barred type of look into my life, including the good, bad, the ugly, how I can, all of the things I didn't understand about sex, my confusion around marriage and the way that I kind of, um, you know, mixed sex and love is the same thing, which we both obviously understand are very two separate things. Great when they are to, to great when they are combined, but, um, not to take, not to take it for granted that they will be. Um, I just wanted to help women like me, Muslim Asian women like me, obviously anybody really, but especially Muslim Asian women like me who who feel excluded from this narrative, who don't get to um, be seen as sexual beings. I wanted us to feel uh, seen. I wanted um, people to kind of understand, like people from outside of my community to understand that we're not repressed and that we're not one dimensional and that we have a lot of autonomy. Um, and yeah, just to kind of, I guess it gives hope that, you know, even if something, you know, a relationship doesn't work out that you can move on. Cause a lot of times in the Asian culture and community, you know, a lifelong marriage is very much <laughs> what you're expected to kind of, um, fulfill. And the reality is it may or may not happen. And so, you have to kind of have other options. You need to be able to find the strength to kind of move on from those things and not blame yourself. Um, so yeah, hopefully it gives a lot of people hope. Mm. What did you find to be the most difficult topic for you to write about? Good question. Um, my mom, um, she attempted to take her life a few times. Um, she has some mental health issues. So I definitely found it hard because as I'm sure you know, when you're writing a book, like, boy, you have to keep rewriting, rewriting all these different edits. So um, reliving that over and over was definitely my hardest part because I feel like when someone's doing that to themselves and you love them, like there's an element of like blaming yourself a little bit um, mm -hmm. as the kind of person who you know, loved that person and, and wasn't able to kind of um, help them or, 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 or help, yeah, help the situation. So it was very difficult to do that. But again, I really wanted to capture it so that, like, you know, to an extent, the people who judge me for what I do could see that it's a lot more complicated than just, you know, what they perceive someone to be. But also, I think that there's a lot of people going through some difficult stuff. So hopefully they could... Um, Maybe give, again, maybe help people feel like things are, there's more hope in the situation or that, you know, actually we all go through something. So even if someone hasn't gone through that specific situation, um, uh, they can emphasize or it gives someone hope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, it's kind of circles back to what we talked about earlier, whereas, you know, this, this common thread through comedy that I think why it works well and people enjoy it so much is is like relating to other people's pain so i have found when i've had people on this show specifically talk about really uh personal and hard things for them the way that my audience has reacted has been um pretty amazing you know people 
are grateful to hear other people's struggles because it makes them feel not so alone. Because I think that's one of the hardest things when we're dealing with something so difficult and so personal is this feeling of loneliness, that you're alone in your pain. And to hear that there are other people out there who are going through the same thing and you feel like there's like a sense of support that you can get from that. I think people really value that. Yeah, especially, you know, um, I think the Asian community, we feel like it feels like we've been kind of stigmatized with this quote unquote shame, which I've never really felt or bought into. Um, So I hope that it makes people feel like, you know, I guess less shame and that, you know, there isn't there isn't something to be ashamed of or, you know, people deal with things in different ways. So maybe putting it out there is not for everybody. But at the same time, it's like I feel like. Nobody can judge anybody, so hopefully we'll just help people um, who who want the help. Um, and certainly, I, I, again, it's just we, we are so underrepresented in terms of in a 3D type of way. So I was just grateful that I had this opportunity to, to be authentic. Um, it certainly wasn't like, you know, the most commercial way of approaching it, because I'm sure if I was being a victim or whatever, um, that maybe you know it was it would be what the market would have received it better but it was more important for me to be authentic and to kind of definitely give more hope to people as opposed to just um spewing like an old <laughs> an old stereotype that doesn't apply over and over again yeah if there was one thing that people could take away from your writing what would you want that to be mm, that's so good question oh that's hard holly um uh I don't know I like to be funny but I'm often told that I'm I help people think so I don't know <laughs> I maybe maybe just a laugh that would be good <laughs> <laughs> you just want to make uh you just want to make people laugh I and think at the same time jokes, to be honest. <laughs> those are the best jokes was I mean <laughs> dick jokes are my favorite jokes you can't exactly. go wrong with a good dick joke <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? And also yes. uh, where they can find your book. Thank you so much. Yes, please. So um, Twitter is so weird right now. So I, I do, I am on there if you want to follow me, but I'm not really that active. So you, please do follow me on Instagram. I'm at Sadia underscore Asmats underscore, um, which is my full surname with an S and underscore. Anyway, I'll say it again. It's at Sadia underscore Asmats. Um, and yeah, please buy Sex Bomb. It's really sexy. Um, you can buy it from wherever you get your bookshops. You can get your local indie bookshop to order it for you, or you can buy it on uh, Amazon or any of the kind of sites online. And also it's on Audible if you want the um, audio version. Is it you reading the book? I did. I read it. I read my book. You have a lovely voice, so I would I would hope so. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you guys can find me um, at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter, of course. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my Patreon, you get access to all kinds of bonus content, early release interviews, live streams. And um, also just go to hollylinks.com for links to every single one of my social media profiles. Go ahead and give Sadia a follow on her socials. Tell her that you saw her here so she knows it wasn't a waste of her time. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week.